Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Rogers. My name is Nathan and today we're going to be looking at a rather anticipated mod for Total War Warhammer 3, Kataf Southern Realms. If you've played Warhammer 1 or Warhammer 2, you've likely either heard of this mod or have played with it extensively, as it is one of those DLC quality mods which is just absolutely amazing and it is really, really, really good here. And there is a lot to talk about, as you can imagine, from the size of this video. So one thing that you'll need to know is this kind of follows the Champions of Chaos format in a sense, as you have four different types of factions, all under the same Southern Realms roster, but it's separated, they're separate units. So think about it this way, Tilia, Estalia, the Border Princes, and the New World Colonies, well, they're their own kind of thing. Yeah, I know, it sounds pretty interesting, and it really, really is. We're going to be talking about a lot, and we're going to jump right into it now. So prepare yourself, because I'm going to try and cover as much as humanly possible about this mod. We're going to start off first with the Border Prince factions, as that's the ones that I actually started playing first in my own playthrough. And what you will notice before anything is where the faction name is and, you know, the character name, you'll notice Armies of the Borderlands. These are the Border Prince factions, and it'll say that they're a jack of all trades roster of skirmishers, specialists, and cost effective compromises. So this means that every sub faction group that you will be playing with this mod is kind of different, right? Anyways, this is the main group of the Border Princes, so Valmir, Gosur, and we've got the following Lord and Faction effects, the Faction effects first. So, Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor, plus 5 Armor, plus 8% damage for all units, rank 7 and above. Recruitment and Upkeep cost, plus 50% for Knights of the Righteous Spear and Sisters of Fury. Construction cost, minus 10% for all buildings. Leadership, plus 5, can recruit Dwarf range so you can get a little bit of dwarf hardiness in your forces. And for the Lord effects, we have allegiance points gained plus 15% for alliances with dwarfs and casualty replenishment rate plus 10% for Lord's army. So your starting location will be Akendorf as your main capital. And this is a pretty interesting start as you'll be fighting already with Skrag the Slaughtermaster. You'll be dealing with a few greenskins in the area, obviously the vampires to the north. I'd say that you're centralized in an area where you're dealing with a lot of enemies because obviously the Badlands, the Orcs are going to be fighting against you. You're going to be dealing with Wurzag very early on, at least from my own experience. So yeah, it's not going to be an easy fight, but it's going to be a fun one. When it comes to your Legendary Lord, you do have some really cool skills. It's going to focus heavily on Alliance with Dwarfs, and I think that's going to help you out early into your campaign, as, well, you're going to be dealing with so many enemies, you're going to want all the help that you can get. Now, keep in mind that you're going to have to keep your allies alive, because is uh, Skarsnik, for some reason, seems to knock out all the dwarf factions. At least that's what I've been seeing a lot in vanilla lately, which is actually kind of funny. But yeah, you do have a lot of items, a lot of stuff with your diplomatic relations with the dwarves. You're going to be able to get a lot of alliances with them, whether it's just basic trade agreements and stuff like that, or if you want to actually go for a military or defensive alliance. I wouldn't though, because you know how the AI is. Uh, but yeah, you have the option, and that's the most important thing. So if you can keep them alive, you can use a lot of trade from them and end up with a decent amount of cash, which is obviously going to be very helpful to you. But maybe you're not interested in playing a human border prince and you rather play as a vampire. Well, Gashnag is over here to give you that option. A Strigoi legendary lord who is um, pretending that he's not a Strigoi. You can actually consider him a good guy vampire if you read up on his lore, to be honest, so... Yeah, let's not take the piss. Anyways, faction effects. Hardened Veteran, Strong Vigor, plus 5 armor, plus 8% damage for all units, rank 7 and above. Diplomatic Relations, minus 30 with the vampire counts. Control, plus 4, this is faction-wide, that's actually a pretty good one. Uh, recruitment and upkeep cost, plus 50% for Knights of the Righteous Spear and Sisters of Fury. Attrition, minus 50% for casualties suffered from vampiric territory attrition. Melee defense, plus 4, when in defense of own territory. This is actually kind of cool, because it fits with the law. He's very protective of his subjects. And then when we go to the Lord effects, we have enemy hero success chance, minus 5%, and hero self-defense. Defense chance plus 20% chance of wounding aggressors. Honestly, these are pretty good. So let's move on to the rest of the stuff though. So you're going to have a pretty interesting start. I actually really like this as you're going to be more in the Badlands itself. You're going to be dealing directly with the Savage Orcs. Maybe try and reclaim Morgheim might be a good idea. You will still have a territory within the lands of the Border Princes, but you're also at war with the Ogres there. So it's going to be something that you're going to lose very early on. 
But yeah, you can easily move into Galbaraz and start building up from there and just kind of breaking through, which I think is perfectly fine. Now, when we start looking onto the character's unique skills, he is going to be quite useful as he's got access to the Law of Shadow, so it's going to be a strong law. His skills, too, are actually quite good because it's going to help you boost up damage for your army versus, say, for example, uh, Chaos, Norska, the Greenskins, but you're also going to get some general buffs, so it's not just focusing on certain factions. So your army is going to be pretty, pretty strong, and he's going to be the one that you're going to be upfront and personal with, which I'd say is pretty useful, considering that if you're going to move into the Badlands itself, you're going to be dealing with Queek, you're going to be dealing with Scarbrand, you're going to be dealing with Malagor, uh, Wurzag is likely to be a problem, then obviously you've got all the people down south, you've got Manfred, if you go up north then you've got to deal with Vlad, yeah, you're going to be having to fight for a decent amount of time. Yes, the dwarves can be a decent ally, but like I said, they normally get knocked out early on, so having that um, extra strength is definitely going to help you out. Now, the tech tree itself isn't too big, and it's actually the same format for all the different subgroups, but just a few changes here and there, which obviously just makes sense. This kind of, again, works with like the whole Champions of Chaos format in mind, which I'm a big fan of. So yeah, we've got this one here. You're going to see this a lot because we will talk about all the other factions too. But yeah, it's not too bad. It's small, but the buffs are very large, hence why it's taking a decent amount of turns here. So 15 turns to actually get there, and then obviously you will be able to get some buffs up to be able to increase the speed. Uh, even at 600%, I think it takes 3 turns each. But yeah, good bonuses all around. There's also a little bit of an experimental doodles thing there. That's for your uh, tortoise tanks, which everyone can get, don't you worry. It's just going to take a while for you to be able to get it. But trust me, once you get them, you'll be fully aware because they are extremely powerful. So we're going to move on to Estalia now, and you'll notice at the bottom left hand, you can see armies of Estalia are reliable and heavily armored roster with versatile conquistador style units. With This is good. Again, you've already seen a big... Uh, stark contrast with the Border Princes one, and you're going to get that two more times after this anyway. So, when we look at this character, we have Lupio Sunscryer, and the faction effects are as follows. So, Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor, plus 5 Armor, plus 8% Weapon Damage for all units rank 7 and above. Collect Tribute Commandment, Additional Tax Rate, plus 5%. However, there is a negative there, Collect Tribute Commandment, Public Order, minus 3. When we go into the Lord Effects, we have the following. Range, plus 20% for Gunpowder, Cavalry, and Infantry units in Lord's Army. Control, minus 4 for Local Province. He's going to be a character that you're going to want away from your areas unless you can keep it safe. Upkeep, minus 10% for Advanced Adventurers, Royal Guard, Raiders and Lancers in Lord's Army, and finally income from all buildings plus 20% in local province. He's gonna make you money, but you might have a few more rebellions in your hand. And the Estalia faction begins in, well you guessed it, Estalia. You'll start with control of the Estalia province and you'll be, well, already at war with Morgur the Shadow Gave. That's gonna be a little bit of a problem, it's gonna be a quite tough fight at the beginning. Uh, you still start off with a decent army though, and then obviously you're gonna have to eventually deal with Ikit Claw, who will likely take Tobaro from you within a few turns. However, if you can take out Morga quite quickly, then you can go back and reinforce Tobaro, and if you're lucky, you should reach there in time. It just very much depends. But yeah, it's a pretty good start, and this one was already expected. So when we move on to the skills that this character has, this character is very melee-based, but he's got some pretty interesting skills. Helpful for moving across the sea, uh, lots of bonuses for actually moving across the sea, income from ports for action wide, all these usual stuff, extra uh, bonuses when fighting against Bretonia, as you're likely going to be dealing with Bretonia early on. You know how this game starts piling on with the anti-player bias and so on but yeah pretty good bonuses all around i like this character i think that he's very much kitted out to do a decent amount of damage and yeah he's quite strong i've been playing with him for a while and to be honest yeah really 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 do enjoy him i've been pretty much playing non-stop since the mod released yesterday and i've not slept yet so yeah fun times Next we have Lady Belladonna, a very popular character from the tabletop back in the day. She is being counted as an Estalian character, but she's actually Talian. You guys might not know this if you're not too well versed with the lore, but Tobaro is actually a part of Talia, not a part of Estalia. Which is why I find it super weird that Creative Assembly made it just part of Estalia, but it could be that uh, Games Workshop have been 
rechanging the lore a little bit, a little retcon here and there. Anyways, if we go into her faction effects, we have the following. Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor, plus 5 armor, plus 8% damage for all units, rank 7 and above. Foster Independence Commandment, additional diplomatic relations, plus 4 with men and high elves. Hero Action Cost, minus 15%. Hero Recruit Rank, plus 3 for Mercenary Captains. Recruitment Cost, minus 30% for Irana Hillmen. And if we go on to the Lord effects, we have the following. Allegiance Points Gains, plus 20%. This is actually a very diplomatic based faction. Hero action success chance minus 5%. Unlocks hero recruitment, master duelist, and finally melee attack plus 5 for embedded heroes in Lord's army. And as you can see, the character also starts in Estalia, but this time in Bilbali, where you've got control of pretty much that whole area. Your main enemy there too is again Morga the Shadow Gave, and then afterwards you're a bit more free to move on but it's very likely that you're going to have to help Lupio to deal with the uh, Skaven threat, which is likely going to cause a lot of problems to you. When you start going into unique skills, you've got quite a few. So obviously you've got access to the Law of Death, which is going to be very, very helpful for you as, well, you know, it's a good law, right? Spirit Leech is a very good spell, especially to take out characters. When you start going into a unique skill line, well, you've got some diplomatic bonuses where you can get loads with different factions. This one you're going to have to pick. And it very much depends on what you really want. Uh, it depends on your playstyle. But you can pretty much make sure that another faction is going to very much like you, which could be a good buffer just in case you're dealing with something else and you need a little bit of a defensive line. All in all, I think it's a pretty good system. And, and it gives you a little bit of a reason to have a bit of replayability with her, to be honest. Mind you, it's the Southern Realms mod, so I'm imagining that a lot of you guys will be playing this quite often because it's DLC quality from what I've been playing, like it's really, really good. So again, Estalia has its own tech tree, which is following the same format that you're going to see through all the Southern Realm factions. However, some things have been changed around. You'll notice that some of them make more reference to Inquisitions and Conquistadors and all that type of stuff, because the Southern Realm focus for the Inquisition in Spain, you know, that's the inspiration. A lot of the Warhammer Fantasy factions are inspired by our own real world in just various points in time. As far as I've seen, no Mel Brooks quotes, right? No The Inquisition and stuff like that. But hey, <laughs> now we're going to move on to Talia, and the first character we have is Borgio the Besieger. What you will also notice in the bottom left hand is armies of Talia, reliable and heavily armored roster with better artillery and cavalry than their neighbors. So you're going to be using a lot of cav and a lot of artillery, which obviously makes sense. Now, when we look towards the faction effects, we have the following. Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor, plus 5 Armor, and plus 8% damage for all units, rank 7 and above. Attrition, minus 15% when under siege. This is a very siege-focused character. Leadership, plus 10 when laying siege or encircling. Now, when it goes to the Lord effects, we have the following. Adds an additional siege tower for each batch built in Lord's army. Can recruit a second company of Braganza's besiegers. And finally, passive ability, Warfighters. So, as the Talia faction, you start naturally in Talia. You'll have access to the whole region, which is going to be quite beneficial for you, as you're going to be starting in a pretty interesting location. As, yeah, you're already starting to fight with Aranessa, who is going to be easy enough to deal with. It depends on pretty much what difficulty you're playing with. But, you know, Ica is going to cause some problems. You've got some orcs to the north. Orion is... Strangely enough, very genocidal, so yeah, a lot of issues there. Now, the character's actually got some pretty cool, unique skills, as it's going to focus very heavily on boosting up your army. So you're going to be able to get an even stronger force, and even stronger if you focus a bit on the red skill line, but it really depends on how you decide to spend your skills, really. But yeah, yeah, very, very strong, very capable. I don't see many problems there. You've got access to quite a few items too, which are going to make you very, very powerful. There's a lot that you can do with this character, and you can tell by the stat line that he also means business. He's there to do a decent amount of damage, and he does a pretty damn good job at that too. I do say that he's one of the better ones if you just want a more I just want to smash stuff campaign, because yeah, fun. Now, for the second Talia faction, we have Leonardo Catraza. This is with the East End Company, and you have the following benefits. So, Hardened Veterans, once again, Strong Vigor, plus 5 Armor, plus 8% damage for units of rank 7 and above. Recruitment cost, plus 20% for all units without direct control of Miragliano. So, it's going to be a pretty expensive campaign. Income from trade uh, tariffs, plus 30%. 
tradable resources produced plus 10%. And when we move on to the Lord effects, we had the following diplomatic relations plus 10 with Goldtooth and Western provinces. You can already kind of guess where he's starting. And weapon strength plus 10% for duelists, pikemen, Republican Guard, and cavalry units in Lord's army. When you start, you're going to be starting in Shangyang, uh, which is actually kind of interesting considering that uh, this is where usually where Dragon Bro tends to go to in his campaign. But yeah, you're starting in Grand Cafe, which means that you're getting a different type of campaign in case you want to play another Southern Realm campaign, but you don't want to be in Talia, Estalia, the Border Prince regions. There's so much replayability because there's just so many different areas, and I really, really do like this. I think this is going to be a very, very popular mod. I mean, it's expected anyway. Replayability, especially when factions are introduced, is always good too. I'm imagining that he'll probably be moved to end in the future when it eventually opens up, considering that uh, the name is there. Anyways, when it comes to unique skills, you have to boost up your forces. You're going to be boosting up the uh, reload time reduction, extra leadership, you're going to be able to get enemy leadership down, get more casualties, uh, but you're going to increase up, say for example, your Lord Upkeep. There's a lot that you can do here actually, it's a pretty interesting character. I do love the implementation of all these characters because you can definitely see that yes, they've got bonuses, but they've got a few negatives too, which kind of just like evens everything out. And hell, right now we've only really been talking about the Lords and just a little bit of faction stuff, not even going too much into detail with it. After this video, I would play some more, but I do need to get some sleep. And as you can expect once again, yes, the Iliad does have its own bit of a tech tree. Again, small one, but expected, and it's going to take a while to get to, but a few changes here and there. It's important to note this because you might come back from an Estalia game and go, oh, I want to try Talia, and then realize that you're getting the wrong bonuses because it's just the bonuses that you had with Estalia aren't there. Or you might just have some better bonuses from this. Either way, you're still going to have to spend a decent amount of turns for it, so it's going to take a while for you to get up and running. This is usually how I feel with the Southern Realm campaigns that you started off a little bit slow, possibly a bit weaker, so you're more susceptible to be damaged against, and then boom, you're getting stronger. And finally, we have the last faction, which is the New World Colonies. These are the colonial armies. As you can see down here, we've got Marco Colombo, Jack of All Trades roster that combines many of the individual strengths of the homeland with fewer of their elites. So yeah, it's going to be a bit of a mix. And if we look into the faction effects, we have the following effects. Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor, plus 5 Armor, plus 8% Weapon Damage for all units, rank 7 and above. Recruitment Cost, plus 25% for all units outside of coastal regions. Diplomatic Relations, minus 20 with the Hunts Marshals Expedition. You can more or less guess where he's starting. Double Experience Gain for units when fighting against rogue armies. Campaign Movement Range, plus 10%. Attrition, minus 80% Casualties Suffered from High Seas Attrition Lord's Army. Leadership, plus 10 when fighting against rogue armies. And for the Lord effects, we have campaign movement range plus 8%, so you're already getting a lot of movement with this character. Ambush defense chance plus 25% for Lord's Army, and diplomatic relations plus 30 with lizard men. Yep, the lizard men are actually going to like you a little bit. Unless you're playing in legendary and then you've got anti player bias kicking in, and then you know everything just turns into the Lustria Bowl. But in terms of star position, we'll be starting off at the Star Tower. So, yeah, you're going to be near a lot of Skaven that you're going to have to fight, you're going to have to fight against Lufa Harkin and so on. But, yeah, it's kind of fun. I kind of like this. I did play around with him a little bit. It's very different from the other New World Colonies. Uh, <laughs> trust me, you're going to see that a little bit later in this video. But yeah, in terms of unique skills, you've got some stuff which is pretty much just like contracts from the Lizardmen, meaning that you're going to get a lot of benefits fighting against other factions. You can fight against the Dark Elves, get extra bonuses. This is all Lord's Army. But it definitely gives you a lot of options, as a lot of these factions are going to be a thorn on your side in Lustra, especially as you start deciding that you want to to expand and you obviously want to considering that this is total war you're not going to just want to stay with one location and give the rest of the lizards now are you and yeah you'll get loads of bonuses you will eventually turn on the lizard men and you'll get loads of faction wide bonuses against them so early on yeah more than worth it to actually stay with them as a friend and then decide well you know all the threats are gone uh you're pretty much in my area now i need to colonize this place time to kill you off
But if you want a more aggressive campaign in general, believe me this one is going to be quite the fun one, you've got El Caravo which has the following faction effects. Hardened Veterans, Strong Vigor plus 5 armor plus 8% damage for all units rank 7 and above. Recruitment cost plus 25% for all units outside of coastal regions. Diplomatic Relations plus 20 with a Hans Marshall's Expedition. Post Battle Chance uh, of Stealing Magical Item plus 15%. Construction costs minus 10% for province capital slash settlement buildings, and this is where it starts getting interesting. Diplomatic relations minus 75 with Lord Mazda Mundi. Diplomatic relations minus 25 with Lizard Men. Then construction time minus 33% for all buildings in local province. This is a Lord effect. And a final minus 25 diplomatic relations with Lord Mazda Mundi. Yes, this is 100 minus at the beginning of your campaign. And uh, he's going to cause problems. <laughs> So you're starting off in the New World Colonies right next to Mazda Mundi, but you've also got a lot of potential enemies. You're starting off at war with Skeggy, who's going to cause problems. Then you've also got the Sinesh factions, the Dark Elves to your north. You've got Orcs and pretty much a lot of different horrors down to your south. You're surrounded. Pretty much by the time that you start dealing with Skeggy, or by the time that you're done with Skeggy, depending on how long it takes you, then you're going to have to start dealing with Mazda Mundi. He's going to be a big problem from the very beginning. But you've got some pretty good skills to help you out with that, obviously. So you do have your tail, the tail of El Cadavo, which, uh, yeah, it's actually a pretty cool system. It's going to help you boost up your character, boost up your army, boost up a lot of different things. But it's kind of like a quest system in a sense. Even though it's you just using your skill points, I think it's actually kind of cool because it gives you something to read too. And everyone loves a little bit of exposition lore. Like, it's cool, right? It adds in a little bit more real playability. And I think that something like that is actually just kind of really, really nice to bring in a little bit more life to a campaign. All in all, good character, good stats all around. Uh, it's just you're going to have to suffer from uh, Mazda Mundi. It's not an easy campaign from what I've played. Uh, I've not really had a lot of time with this character, mostly because I've been playing around with all the factions to get a general gist. Like, it is 5 o'clock in the morning by the time that I'm recording this video right now, right? And finally, again, dedicated tech tree, which is going to be the very much the same, but there's a few changes here and there, just to give you more of a feel for your own faction. I actually really like the system. Again, it's from pretty much the whole Champions of Chaos thing, and I think that works out really, really well. Sub-factions like this, it's stuff that I want to see more, not just in official content, but hopefully in mods too, as it might allow for people to just go crazy and do loads of really cool ideas. And this is where the tabletop aspect of Warhammer and the modding aspect of Total War get so well mixed up together, it's just great. Now, yes, eight playable factions. Construction is going to be very much the same, which isn't really a bad thing. Some buildings may differ here and there, but it's not really that noticeable. It just depends on your faction's flavor. But it goes in the same format, like I said, and infrastructure will go all the way up to rank five. So you're going to be able to build up a very high trade uh, empire. But then again, that's expected because you are the Southern Realms and a lot of traders are known through that region. Some of your basic military buildings, you can only build one in that region. So you can interchange, kind of like cafe, but it's more of the case of you're going to need multiple areas if you want to get these. And you will notice a lot of your buildings are very much tied to going up to tier four and tier five. So if you want the best of the best, you're going to need a lot of capitals more than anything. Like, yeah, there's a few good things that you can get from tier two and three, but yeah, you know, you want the good stuff, right? It's going to have to make you plan a bit more, I guess. It depends if you want this major city to be a trade hub or a military hub or maybe a bit of both. But definitely you should start focus on taking the major cities when you start attacking new provinces as, yeah, yeah, you, you want this stuff. Also keep in mind that yes, there are landmarks around the area and there are resource buildings that you will greatly benefit from. So those have to definitely be targets too. I don't know how you guys play personally, but I generally try to go for the main city first as it always is a walled city. So it's a bit easier to defend and that way I can start progressing and taking over the rest of the region. Also, it does depend on what way I attack, but I'll try to focus the main city. Now, all the factions will make use of a mechanic called Plutocracy, which is the Tomb King mechanic that we all know because it got reused for the Dwarves by Creative Assembly. And this is an interesting thing, right? Because you can get some stuff like, for example, being able to hire Master Duelists or Wizards or even the 
other Lord option that we'll be going through later. Uh, this one you can get every 100 turns. Or you can get some Companies of Renown, which is a new type of unit. You can get yourself some Strategies, which is going to give you some bonuses faction-wide, or, you know, just some general diplomatic relations with certain factions. You can get some weapons and items. All of this you're going to have to pay for. And, yeah, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, you're going to need a decent amount of cash. If you're playing as the Southern Realms, you're playing as Mercenaries, and you're going to have a decent amount of cash coming in any way, as long as you know how to manage your stuff. But it definitely helps to get some diplomatic relations going up. You're going to lose stuff, though. So say, for example, uh, if you get diplomatic relations with Bretonia, you will lose upkeep for cavalry units. Well, you'll gain extra upkeep for cavalry units. Get some bonus relations with the High Elves, but you'll lose some with the Dwarves. There's also some other benefits depending on which one you pick. And in general, I like this. I like this system, especially the item stuff. It will get you your characters to be a bit stronger, just in case that you might not be getting the drops that you might actually be wanting for certain characters. Now we're going to start looking towards generic Lord options. Mercenary Generals are very common, and it's important to note that if you play as a Mercenary General here and then with one in Talia, uh, they will have some different skills, but they'll generally serve the same purpose. So we're not going to go over all of them, or else this video is going to be about two hours long, and it's already around, what, 25 minutes at this point, and we still haven't gone over the roster? So yeah melee character, the usual stuff that you're kind of used to. Very similar to the Empire General, but that's not a bad thing, as sometimes you want a proper type of melee character. If we move on, we've got the Pathfinders, and by the way, not all the Lord options are available to all the factions, so this is another thing of why replayability is going to be so good here. It kind of works again like Champions of Chaos, where you've got different mix and match. The Pathfinder itself is a range character and you're able to boost up your range capabilities you'll also be able to get a repeater handgun if you decide to mount him on a horse i kind of like this different mount options sometimes will change your weapons uh it's usually just giving you an extra range weapon and stuff but i think that's kind of cool so this is another example where i'm playing as estalia now before i was doing the border print stuff and as estalia i've got access to inquisitor lords instead of pathfinders and these are very much like Witch Hunters, but a lot stronger, pretty good stats, able to be up front without too much of an issue. Uh, I like them, I like them. It's the idea of having so much of a difference, having all this to play around with. It's a great thing, in all honesty, because it allows you to just have some fun, get a little bit of theming, because these are factions in Warhammer Fantasy that we still don't know too much about. Their lore is being expanded upon recently, which is great. Uh, but even then, we still don't know really too much about Talia, Estalia, the Border Princes, and even the New World Colonies on how they act in different situations and what their armies are and so on. Merchant Princes are for Talia, and you'll notice that Talia has a really cool thing with the Merchant Princes where you've got two different blue skill lines, and those are kind of based on, you know, your economy and just general things like that. Again, really super cool because you can have a Merchant Prince staying and being kind of like buffer for your areas or you can have him out there doing some damage he's more than capable because the stats in general are just really really good it's definitely got a lot of that Talia feel to it as a lot of the mercenaries do come directly from Talia so you're expecting them coming in and out from here and the High Eagle is a very special Lord option which you'll get a chance to recruit every hundred turns so it's going to be a while until you get others but it's essentially a Warrior Priest Lord very very good stats overall so it's going to do a lot of damage a decent amount of options for pretty much mounts and everything really it's pretty damn good the only thing is it's going to take a while 100 turns will fly by if you're playing a long campaign but uh, how many of us actually go for 100 turns it only makes it a little bit more special though when we go towards the heroes we've got a few different options so with the highling wizards we've got a lot of different laws of magic pretty much everything that's available towards the empire We'll likely get the missing laws of magic whenever we actually get them implemented for the Empire officially. And uh, yeah, this gives you options. This gives you loads and loads of different options. So your playstyle will stay very much the same if you know how to use your magic. Mercenary Captain will act as your melee based character. He's got a few buffs here and there and you can also get him with a few bits of ammunition. It very much depends on how you want to use it. Um, to be honest, I kind of use him more melee. I don't know, I don't tend to use the range characters as range characters, I guess. But that depends on your playstyle. I'm just saying because he's got pretty good stats overall and that just kind of helps. The next one is the Master Duelist and this one is again pretty good at melee. Like, yeah, like he's a duelist. 
it's in the name, I guess. Uh, but you can make it into a ranged character if you so wish by just sticking him onto the horse. Again, it depends on who you're playing in terms of faction, because if you're going for more skirmishing style, the horse will probably do you some good so you can harass your enemy more. Uh, I prefer him on foot. He's been doing a lot of good damage on foot. Still does a decent amount of damage on the horse but I feel like it just fits better on foot. My favorite hero, on the other hand, has been the Priestess of Mamidia, as, yeah, she's a battle priest. You've got loads of really cool bonuses there, you know, just aerial effects to boost up your troops. She's able to do a decent amount of damage. The model looks really, really, really cool, because, you know, spear and shield, and just... It's going through the design that we're already kind of used to, because of lore interpretations. It's just awesome. There's so many options, that's the thing. You are completely spoiled for choice when it comes to well, anything with this mod that uh, it's a little overwhelming, but in a very good way. Like, this video is not doing the mod justice, even though it's going to be close to about 40 minutes or maybe more, mostly because there's just so much. Also, there's something important to note. There are some other legendary characters that I haven't discussed in this video. Like, for example, this legendary character, because there's certain events that will pop up and you'll be able to get special things. And I think that's really, really cool because it gives you incentive to travel a little bit. As I needed to go to Magrita, which is fine because I'm playing as a stallion faction here. And then I have to go down to deal with some Tomb Kings. There's definitely a lot of theming there and you'll see that when you end up looking for the other stuff. Like, for example, Lorenzo Lupo, who looks really, really cool. And I'm just putting a Knights in Carmine character there because... Uh, <laughs> I really like that knightly order. It is my favorite out of all the knightly orders, and he just looks really, really freaking cool. Like, I know it's not one of the most popular knightly orders, but just the red armor like that is just so great. I spent so many days and weeks kit bashing my own knightly orders. So seeing these guys here in a very similar style, it just brings a smile to my face. But now we have to start talking about the roster, which, as you can see, is absolutely gargantuan. Yeah, there's a lot of troops, and this is just to flesh out your faction fully. So it doesn't feel like, say, for example, when a race gets added into Total War, where it's just feeling a little empty. Like, for example, right now, Kizev and Cafe. This is just pretty much feeling like a complete race. And I think this is really helping the faction feel fleshed out, especially when you decide to play. So there's a lot to talk about the units, and we're going to jump right in, as uh, it's a very big roster. The best uh, way to start is the Militia Spearmen. Not too much to talk about them, but their spears were shield, and that's a really good thing, because obviously that already gives you some anti-large very, very early on into your campaign. And you know, large monsters are a big thing in Warhammer, so shields... Helpful spears even more so. And you're going to get a lot of different things. Like, for example, we've got the half pikes, which are just really, really cool. Another anti-large unit. You're going to have a lot of anti-large with this uh, roster, by the way. It's just going to be very, very common. But they are pretty cool. They do a lot more damage if they're actually winning in combat and they've got a certain amount of HP. And, I mean, it's pikes, right? How many people have been wanting pikes for Total War Warhammer? I know I'm one of them. It's something that... Uh, has been taking a while. Billmen are actually going to be a unit that you might use often as, well, you know, halberds are very, very good, especially since they're anti-armor. Having some armor piercing in the melee form is obviously going to be quite useful for you, and again, you've got the benefit of anti-large once again, because... You know, it's technically a spear in a sense. I know it's not, but you know what I mean. And they're considered, you know, pretty low tier, which is a good thing, as that means that you're going to have them early on, and you're going to need them as you start dealing with pretty much all the big monsters, and well, just in case the dwarves decide to turn on you. Let's be very honest there. And surprise, surprise, we have more anti-large stuff with the pikemen. Yes, again, this is going to be a very common thing in your army, and you might get a little tired of it, but I think they look freaking cool, and pikes are just awesome. Like, I've got some of the Dogs of War pikemen. These are tabletop miniatures, and they just look awesome because... Uh, uh, you know, it's a big weapon, and who doesn't want to, like, show off, right? Now we're getting some defensive units, and you will realize it's actually kind of late into your roster for your infantry units, but these are the Adventurers and Sword and Board, right? Very basic, it's already what you know, you've already used these types of units long time already, but... Pretty good stats, you know, 70 armors, nothing to sniff at. Shield is quite good for defenses, so you'll be able to block a little bit. In general, very, very good unit. Looks really cool too. And that's a big thing, because, you know, cool factor is cool factor. And they fit with the theme. I know some people think that some of the uh, human factions are a little boring, but this is kind of what you expect. They get a little bit more stylized when you start looking towards, for example, the Duelist, which is anti-infantry. They're a damage dealer. They're pretty good to move around. They do quite a lot of damage. Uh, you know, it's your typical type of uh, musketeer, I guess. Those quickly move on to more anti-large units with the Republican Guard. So this is Halberdiers, but they're heavily armored, armor-piercing, just really, really cool looking. 
the paint scheme is probably not the best for this unit, but then again, this is because I'm playing with a default faction. This is the default Talia one, I think. But yeah, good unit. Again, the lighting issue is not the mod itself, it's just the game, uh, which hopefully will get fixed in a future patch. I think Creative Assembly did mention it on their known issues list. Now, shield bearers are multi-purpose, but I really, really like them. So again, an anti-large unit is spear and shield. Sorry, I just find it funny because obviously it's a race that you expect to have loads of different anti-large units, uh, but it's scaling damage. Uh, they've got armor, they've got shield. They're very, very strong. I love the design. I really like the design. It's definitely a unit that you can actually keep up front and personal, not worry too much about. Sure, they're not going to be as good as, say, for example, an anti-infantry unit and so on, but they're definitely going to be able to hold back the enemy line, and that's the most important thing, especially when it comes to just any type of enemy that you're going to be dealing with, right? A good spear and a shield is going to help anyway. If you want a few more elites, you've got the Black Watch, which, uh, yeah, halberd infantry once again, but very, very good stats. Armored, armor piercing, anti-large, able to do a lot of damage. Like, these guys pack a hell of a punch. So, yeah, you guys want these guys up front. They're just ripping apart anything like Chaos Warriors, Chosen, all that type of stuff. We got the Sisters of Fury now, and this is another anti-large unit. I would say take a shot any time I say anti-large, but uh, you might die. Uh, so armored, armor piercing, anti-large. Uh, they've got access to a few different abilities too, so this makes them kind of like a hero squad, despite the fact that they're a unit squad. So you've got a few different augments that will just help you do a lot more damage, and I think that works out quite well. They're definitely quite stylized, and it is nice to see more church-themed units too, because... I, I don't know, it just feels like we don't get enough of that in Total War so far. The last melee unit is the Montante Swordsman, and these are armored, armor piercing, anti infantry, and defender. They don't have a shield, but they're able to do a decent amount of damage. Pair them up with, say, for example, the spear and shield unit, and you've got quite a nice little combo here. Obviously, this is if you're going for a very melee focused uh, army. It depends on how you're playing, and you most likely will be mixing and matching. We're moving on to the range units now, and there's quite a few as you can see. On the beginning, you've got Militia Archers. They're not the greatest. Uh, only 140 range, but it kind of makes sense because you do have a lot of different options. Uh, yeah, they're kind of bad. But it's a low cost of entry and you'll be able to get some Archers early on. It is important to note here that all the units you'll be seeing here, you won't be able to get them with all the factions, right? Some of them split into Tilia specific, Astalia specific. It's just to make sure that everything's there, but I can't like spend all that time going into distinctions because there's so many units, as you can see. Uh, there's, for example, the crossbowmen here, which, yeah, if you've used crossbowmen before, you know how to use them, right? It's a common staple unit within the Empire and uh, doesn't really need too much explaining. Make them shoot, make them do damage. Same thing with the handgunners, and I'm pretty sure these are a little bit worse because they've got 130 range. Did the handgunners not have 140? Well, the Empire ones at least. But either way, it's an armor-piercing missile unit. You're going to get better as you go into your campaign anyway, so you don't have to use these for too long, and they're still going to be relatively useful. The next unit itself is when things got getting a little bit more interesting. Uh, so obviously you've got the border rangers, right? 160 range, uh, they've got Vanguard too, which is obviously very useful. They're decent in melee too, and they can fire whilst moving. So you're going to get a lot better use out of these units. You're going to have a lot more fun. And in general, I kind of like these. Like, yeah, very, very cool units. Pervase crossbowmen are crossbowmen, but with shields, meaning that you'll still have the same stats as a generic crossbow, but they'll be a bit more defensive, right? They'll be able to take a little bit less damage from range, and they'll be a bit better in melee. Clearly, you don't want them in melee, and they have a decent amount of ammunition, but just in case they get bogged down, it will make things a little bit easier for you, which is obviously going to be at a benefit. Plus, they look freaking cool, right? I, I love these. They're just so awesome. When we move on, we've got the Iranian Hillmen, and these ones are actually kind of cool. So, um, another Vanguard unit. Uh, they're guerrilla units, so they're very good at, like, hit-and-run tactics, but they're not good at being, like, held down. They will start to crumble really, really quick. They've got a little bit of range. They've got some shields. It's pretty much just a buckler, but that doesn't really matter because I don't think bucklers have a different distinction in Total War, at least in Warhammer. But if you like using some skirmishing troops, this might be the unit for you. 
when we move on a little bit more, this is another cool unit. So these are just basically Corsars. Uh, they've got the axes, they've got bows, and you're already kind of used to playing with hybrid units if you've played with Kislev or, well, even a little bit of the Hiles, for example. So yeah, not too much to explain here. Armored, armor piercing, melee, they do a lot of damage. Very good up close, but decent on the side too if you want to just use the arrows first. Royal Guards are what you're going to replace your handgunners with as, yeah, same stats more or less when it comes to the damage output, but uh, decent in melee and they've also got armored, so they'll be able to hold out their own. Again, very useful because there's certain factions that will try to flank you or will get to you as they'll start ripping apart some of your front line. So having your support also being very heavily armored, even though it's going to make your armies a bit more expensive, is still going to be beneficial to you, just in case they need it. And finally, we have the Swashbucklers, which are a unit of, well, pretty much just like militia units, right? Not great on stats, but still decent enough. Uh, close quarter, infantry, they can fire whilst moving and they can do a decent amount of damage, but you just want them up there, uh, kind of like a harassing unit. It depends on what you want to use them for. I've not really been using these, if I can be very honest, but that's because I don't like the militia units, so it's the same kind of thing. But if we start moving on to cavalry, there's also a decent amount of cavalry. You'll start off with uh, basic light scouts, which have vanguard, which is very, very useful, of course. And then everything starts getting a little bit more stylized. But uh, yeah, just not a unit I use often, mostly because I'm terrible with scouts. Lancers will be one of your first type of knights. And, you know, lancers, shields, pretty good stats overall. Pretty fast, too. Like 84 speed isn't too bad, and they look great. I love the colorful lancers, too. It makes them kind of pop on the battlefield a bit more, which, yes, I know is not the most important thing, but it does kind of help out when you're as blind as I am when it comes to playing Total War. The militia knights themselves look freaking cool, too, because, like, the color scheme works really well. Nothing that I'd actually paint, because painting white is just horrible, but you know what I mean. And uh, yeah, Sword and Shield, it's a little bit better, a bit slower, but still able to do a decent amount of damage, quite good armor, it's kind of what you want from these types of units. Not too much to talk about the Bretonian Knights, uh, well, Freelance Knights, but yeah, they're Bretonians that are just working as freelancers. Before someone says that this goes against the law, yes, being a mercenary is unlawful when it comes to being a Bretonian, uh, well, knight, but uh, it still happens, it still actually happens, it's uh, just a rare thing. When we move on, we do have the Broken Lancers. These guys are cool. No shield, but pretty big damage. Uh, decently fast. They're very noticeable. That's the main thing. And it's mostly the case of that. You're going to get loads of horses because remember that not every faction has the same units. Knights of the Righteous Spear come in as a pretty strong unit once again. And they've got anti-large. Yeah, it's been a while since we've said that. But yeah. Good damage overall, they're armored and shielded, they look pretty cool. The glare kind of ruins it a little bit, but that's not the mod's fault, unfortunately. It's just what we have to deal with until it gets fixed up. But there are certain units like these where it kind of makes sense, you know, just like very, very bright, but it's uh, it's just a bit annoying. I know, I know, it's, it's not their fault. Anyways, if we start moving on, we've got the Knights in Carmine, and these are the better Knightly Order because they're just freaking awesome. Right, so these are very different because they're anti-infantry and mounted. Uh, very good stats all around. Very, very good stats. But, yeah, Knights in Carmine, man. Like, one of the coolest knightly orders. I know some people like others, but these are definitely freaking awesome. It's just... It's the color scheme. I don't know why, but it's the color scheme. And lastly, for the melee horses, we've got the Noble Retinue. These guys are pretty cool. Definitely gives you a lot of shot cavalry options when you're playing as the different factions. So, you've got a little bit to mix and match with. I prefer the Knights in Carmine, but hey, that's just me. It depends on your playstyle. Shock Cavalry is always very useful, especially if you're dealing with hordes and stuff. And you're going to be dealing with a decent amount of hordes, because no matter which one you're playing with, you're bound to deal with Skaven, because they're pretty much everywhere. And yeah, I think everyone is close to a Skaven faction, actually. So yeah, yeah, you're going to actually kind of need these. We're moving on to the range cavalry now, and the first ones are the riders. So these are pistoliers, basically, but they're armored, actually very well armored for being more or less a low tier, I'd say. Uh, they've got vanguard deployment too, which is very useful. You'll actually notice that a lot of the missile cavalry has vanguard, uh, but they're weak against armor. Which, in all honesty, is a bit of a weird thing, as they are using pistols, but I guess it's to kind of even it out, which, yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, overall, pretty good still. They are, like, pretty decent. If we start moving on a little bit further than that, we have the Enforcers, and these are 
very fast. These are your scouts, basically. These are your range scouts. Uh, they've got Vanguard 2. Pretty good stats all around. Good shots, good range, 135. It's definitely not the best, but it's not the worst either. So yeah, you've got something decent there. Now, these guys are actually really, really good because they're basically handgunners with horses. They've got the same amount of range as handgunners, 145. They're armored too. They're armor pissing missiles. They've got Vanguard. So you can essentially have a horse gun line, which is actually fairly powerful. And uh, yeah, I was actually quite surprised, but no, no, they're very, very, very good. Uh, it's amazing how really strong basic handgunners become when you give them 84 speed because they can zoom around pretty well and get them into position without too much of an issue. Like they can do a lot of damage and they can become really, really devastating. Definitely a unit that you want in your army, that's for sure. Anyways, if we start moving on, we're almost at the end now. We have some crossbow units on a mount, which isn't too bad, to be honest. Again, pretty good. 150 range, not too bad at all. Easy to move around. Same purpose, just without the armor-pissing weapons. And yeah, still very capable about basically doing a lot of damage. And they're fairly decent armored too, so all in all, not a bad unit. Lastly for range we have the Paymaster's Chest Wagon which kind of acts like a war shrine in a sense. It's got a few bits of auras, it's got a bit of range damage too, it's not a lot of range. Uh, but yeah, it's a war wagon. It's a hybrid of a war wagon slash uh, war shrine and it kind of works. I haven't really used them too much, mostly because for the life of me I just don't know how to use a war wagon effectively. Um, it's a bit of a weird thing, but for some reason, even after so many years since we've had them in the Empire roster, I just don't know how to use them well. Yeah, we got a little bit of artillery, so some basic light cannons and some mortars, stuff that you're already used to as, well, it kind of makes sense to have this. You're a human nation, and the human nations will make use of these types of weapons because it's just very common. And if we start moving on a little bit further, we've got the Galloper Guns, which I absolutely adore. This is because they're like cannons, yeah, but you can move them around super, super quick. All you have to do is just click on the ability and they'll, you know, pack in and use the horse to move around with. I love the system. It's a unit that was in the tabletop. You could get it in the Dogs of War army way back in the day. And yeah, it's really interesting to see how more effective a cannon becomes when you're just moving them around. I forgot about the tortoise tank which is absolutely silly of me considering that this is a mainstay unit. So yeah, absolutely amazing, right? Like this is your version of the steam tank. Very, very slow but very, very powerful. It's got so much to do and you can increase the capacity for your tech tree. It's going to be something that's going to take a while for you to get but it's definitely going to be worth it. You're going to notice this. Like you are really going to notice when you start fielding these on the battlefield. They are just so cool. I absolutely love them. These are something that we obviously had in the older version, but like this is just so cool. But yeah, I'm not going through the Regiments of Renown. I'm not going through the special Regiments units. I'm going to allow you to discover those mostly because it is close to 6 a.m. now. I do need some sleep. And um, yeah, this is a very long video. I actually thought I was going to be talking for 30 minutes, but it's actually close to like 51. And I will say that this is a phenomenal mod. Again, if you've played this in Warhammer 1 or Warhammer 2, you already know what you're coming into. But it's so cool. It's already available for you to download. It was out yesterday, actually. So you can find it linked directly in the description below. You're going to want to play this. It's got so much replayability. We know for a fact that we're not getting any DLC until Q2. And this is a DLC quality mod. Sure, it's got no custom voice lines and stuff because I think that it's just like impossible to do with how voice files are actually encrypted in Total War. But look at this. This is definitely something for you to play. You've got four factions in one mod. Well, eight factions and four sub-factions, if that makes sense, right? So there's so much to play with and it's definitely going to keep you entertained. With all that being said, let me know what you guys think about it in the comments below. I'm going to get some much needed rest now. I really, really need some rest, and I'll see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day, and uh, yeah. I'll let the rest of the battle play out. I'm playing against a randomly generated vampire count army, and I used a randomly generated army for myself, because uh, I like testing it like that. When I'm going to do a um, showcase for a battle, randomly generated seems better than min-maxing, you know? Our steeds are restless! To battle! Weapons are yours! We are Sigmaters! Take them off! 
Awaiting orders! We obey. Ready to fire! Spearman! The Empire endures! The Heldenhammer! At speed! Attack! Withdraw! Command artillery! Outriders! Fire! Fire! Crossbowmen! Conditions acceptable! To battle! The Empire and Jaws! For the twin-tailed comet! Cannons! Fire! For Heldenhammer! Target! We serve the Emperor! Kill or be 